on the role of trails in economic recovery. I'm Kevin Mills, Vice President of Policy at Rails to Trails, and I'll be your moderator. Our panel today features uh, Jenny Sellen, who is a city council member and former mayor in Morgantown, West Virginia. Patty Hansen, who's the Director of Strategic Partnerships for Brookhaven, Georgia, and Rob Innerfeld, who's Transportation Planning Manager for Eugene, Oregon. These panelists represent small, medium, and large cities, and each has a compelling story of trails and other walking and biking facilities providing benefits to their communities, such as safety, health, equity, mobility, and uh, economic development. Each has ambitious plans to further connect their facilities to everyday destinations and to other communities to achieve transformational improvements in quality of life. In the context of the coronavirus epidemic, there's growing societal awareness of the critical need for safe places to walk, bike, and roll for transportation, for recreation, and for physical and mental well being. Booming demand on trails has prompted efforts to create close to home places to be uh, active at a social distance. And Rails Trails Conservancy has been encouraging this with a petition, webinars, and tools. At the same time, economic distress has prompted the US Congress to pass a series of relief measures with more expected to come. The role of trails and active transportation in economic recovery and their potential place in this unfolding policy debate will be our specific focus today. Constructing active transportation facilities create more jobs per dollar than other transportation projects because they are relatively labor intensive. Uh, direct construction jobs from uh, building trails and active transportation facilities are estimated by AASHTO, the State DOT Association, at 17 jobs per million dollars spent. Beyond that, trails in particular have proven time and again to be valuable economic drivers, returning many times their costs in terms of economic vitality from tourism, goods and services, healthcare costs avoided, and, and much more. The stories you'll hear today show a compelling need not only for more federal investment in active transportation, but also to maximize the impact of investments by strategically directing resources to connect existing facilities to create safe, seamless walking and biking routes to every destinations and between communities. RTC favors four complementary active transportation funding measures for the next federal transportation law, which is due in September. The most critical step will be to accelerate completion of trail and active transportation systems with the focused investments called for in the Connecting America's Active Transportation System Act, or HR 5696, and it's also S3391. Just as roads and rails are designed as systems that connect people to places, it's high time that we do the same for active transportation. Current programs build critical projects everywhere, but are too diffuse to build systems in a reasonable time period. And that's why HR 5696 is essential in addition to those existing programs, essential to our future success. So now for some uh, logistics about your participation in this webinar. Attendees have been muted to keep background noise to a minimum, and you'll not be able to speak during the webinar. If you experience any technical problems, please contact GoToWebinars, free customer support directly, or view a selection of help topics at the links that show, are shown now on the screen. You might want to consider copying those down before we move on from this slide. If you lose your webinar connection, please re-click on your login link and you'll be able to rejoin the ongoing session at any time. But also, if you have internet connection problems, you can use your phone to dial into the meeting and you'll be able to listen. We're gonna save time for questions at the end, uh, ample time for that. And uh, we uh, want you to type your questions in the question box that's on the right-hand side of the screen, and you can do that at any time. After today's webinar, you'll receive a follow-up email with a survey asking you to rate today's webinar and uh, a link, give you a link to the webinar recording, and it'll also include some information about Rails and Trails' policy work and have a link to sign up for occasional email notices from us. So next, we're gonna to turn to the panelists, and I'll return after that to explain the climate on Capitol Hill and share my thoughts about what Congress and you could do this year to help. Um, so first, our first panelist is going to be Rob Innerfeld. As Transportation Planning Manager for the City of Eugene since 2007, 
Rob's responsible for development of a citywide transportation plan, multimodal corridor planning, traffic calming, and programs to encourage use of alternatives to single occupancy driving. Under Rob's leadership, the city has built significant new walking and biking infrastructure um, and developed Eugene's first standalone transportation system plan and initiated new transportation option programs such as Sunday Streets. Previously, Rob worked as senior planner for the city of Tacoma Park, Maryland, where I am right now. And uh, Rob has a master's of regional planning. Rob. Thank you, Kevin. Great. Yep. Well, so I'm gonna start out by providing an overview of Eugene. We are a city of around 172, uh, I'm sorry, 170,000 people, and we cover 42 square miles. And like all cities in Oregon, we are surrounded by an urban growth boundary. And then outside of that, besides our next door city of Springfield, we're surrounded by farms and forest land. And we're home to the University of Oregon, which has around 25,000 students. We're located at the southern end of the Willamette Valley between the Cascade Mountains and the Coast Range and then the Pacific Ocean. And in terms of walking and biking facilities, we have 49 miles of shared use paths, 166 miles of bike lanes, but less than 10 miles of those are protected and buffered lanes, which are, are our emerging standard. And we have numerous safe pedestrian crossings of busy streets using tools like crossing islands, stutter flashes, and pedestrian signals. And many of these connect to schools and bus stops for lane transit district. We have a long history of developing our shared use path network going back to the 1970s. Four of our five pedestrian and bicycle bridges over the Willamette River were a partnership with our local utility which runs water lines under the bridge deck, including in the example you see here of the Greenway Bike Bridge. Here in Eugene, we use the term shared use path to denote our paved pathways and the term trail for our soft surface facilities. We have 12 miles of paths along the Willamette River and three other extensive path networks that connect to different parts of Eugene. Our walking and biking network provides significant community benefits, including carbon-free and low-cost transportation, health benefits from being active, and connections to places where people shop, work, and study. There is broad acceptance in our community of the importance of walking and biking infrastructure, and especially of our shared use paths. And this culture has incubated some iconic bike manufacturers, including Burley and Bike Friday. Next slide, please. Now I'd like to review some of our key plans and policies. Our city council takes seriously our responsibility to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from transportation. In 2014, they adopted a climate recovery ordinance that commits the city to one, reduce community fossil fuel use by 50% of 2010 levels by 2030. And secondly, to reduce total community greenhouse gas emissions to amount an amount that is no more than the city's share of 350 parts per million by 2100, which is a decrease of about 7.6% per year. In 2017, the city council adopted Eugene's first standalone transportation system plan. And some highlights from the plan are that one of the five goals is to triple the percentage of trips made by walking, biking, and public transportation by 2030. We're now including electric scooters as part of that too, in terms of how we talk about it. It's something we did not envision in 2017. Uh, one policy that's relevant is to create conditions that make bicycling more attractive than driving for trips of two miles or less. The plan envisions a robust network of sidewalks, neighborhood greenways, protected bikeways, shared use paths, and pedestrian and bicycle bridges. Neighborhood greenways and protected bikeways will connect our existing shared use path network to our downtown and other major destinations. And the total cost of these pedestrian and bicycle facilities that are identified in our plan is 72 million, which is of course an estimate. The total cost of implementing the plan does not include significant costs to maintain and rehabilitate our shared use path network, just as we do for our street system. It also doesn't include smaller scale interventions like safe pedestrian crossings. Even as we, even as we have built out our walking and biking network, we have not made significant progress toward achieving our climate and active transportation goals. We recognize that we need to be even more aggressive around building active transportation infrastructure and expanding our transportation options programming. 
I'm happy to say that right now we've just started construction of a key protected bikeway along 13th Avenue in Eugene. It's a two-way protected bikeway and a one-way street, and it will connect our downtown to the University of Oregon. We also have funding for three additional protected bikeways that we will build over the next few years. And a lot of these projects we're trying to build in order to get ready for the 2022 World Track and Field Championships, which will be held in Eugene, and it'll be the first time they've been held in the United States. Next, I'm going to talk about how we fund active transportation in Eugene. We're fortunate to have significant local funding for walking and biking infrastructure. We we collect what are called systems development charges, which are fees on developers. In much of the country, they're known as impact fees. And most of that funding we put towards active transportation. We also have a pavement bond measure that the voters authorized for the third time. The most recent one was $52 million for paving our streets. It includes $1 million per year dedicated to walking and biking infrastructure. Our recent parks bond also includes funding in it for lighting our shared use paths. And we also received some funding from the state gas tax that we put towards bicycle and pedestrian safety projects in particular. The state of Oregon also has several grant programs that are relevant. There's a Safe Routes to School grant program that was a pretty significant achievement in, in our buyer legislature in 2017, where they dedicated first for a couple of years, $10 million, and then increasing to $15 million per year for Safe Routes to School projects. Um, one limitation is because our state gas tax is constitutionally limited to the right of way these funds can only be spent in, spent in the street right away. There's also a state program that uses federal safety funds called All Roads Transportation Safety. This has been a great resource and there's a set aside within it for active transportation projects. Uh, the state didn't use to fund spend these federal funds on local streets, but FHWA leaned on them to do that. And so that's when they called it, why they called it All Roads because it's both state DOT roads and local streets that are eligible for the program. And um, protected bikeways and safe pedestrian crossings are, are called crash reduction factors. And so they actually, we have to, we show how um, using data, how we will reduce crash risk by implementing these key pedestrian and bicycle safety features. The state has a new grant program called Oregon Community Paths that combines their, trans, their statewide transportation alternative funds with state funding, some of which is collected through a tax on bicycle sales. Because there's not a lot of TA funds received by the state and this bicycle tax is very modest, which is a good thing, there's just not a lot of funding in the statewide grant program. So besides the Safer to School grant program, Oregon does not dedicate a lot of funding towards walking and biking infrastructure. They used to dedicate more, especially through Lexi and their federal, federal transportation funds, which were flexible, towards active transportation. They are not doing that much anymore from what I can tell. So that's been kind of disappointing. Next slide, please. So like most metropolitan or metropolitan areas in the country, any that are around 50,000 or more, we're part of a metropolitan planning organization. And through that, we received three different kinds of funds, surface transportation block grant, CMAC, and transportation alternatives. And you can see here how much our MPO receives per year. This is the estimate for 2022. And unfortunately, the TA funds are a very small part of that, that larger mix. Fortunately, our policymakers are, have a pretty strong dedication to active transportation, and we're able to put the, the projects that Eugene applies for out of all three pots of funding are, are focused on active transportation for the most part. Um, large active transportation projects can be challenging to fund. And lastly, I'm just gonna talk about briefly about one project. On the top here, you can see the Delta Ponds Pedestrian and Bicycle Bridge. This bridge, completed in 2010, goes over a highway to connect our riverfront path system to a large neighborhood. It cost around $6 million and was, was funded by a combination of federal and local funds. And the final piece of funding was two and a quarter million dollars from the transportation enhancements component of the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act stimulus package. So that was what came out of that recession as a way to stimulate our economy. And like Kevin was saying, these kinds of projects are more labor intensive. You know, building a bridge is a lot more labor involved than paving a street, from what I, my understanding. And in order to make this project work, one of the initial parts of funding that we received was a congressional earmark by uh, Congressman Peter DeFazio of around a million dollars. And that's kind of what got the project started in terms of our funding. So later, I'd be happy to take any questions about the work we do here in Eugene around active transportation. Thank you. Thanks, Rob.
So next we'll have uh, Patty Hansen, who's Director of Strategic Partnerships for the City of Brookhaven. Her primary role is leveraging local dollars via federal, state, and partnership funding in order to deliver major projects. She joined Brookhaven in 2016 as the new city sought to launch a grants program. And Patty works closely with the, the Atlanta Regional Commission, the Georgia Department of Transportation, and represents Brookhaven with regional trail partners and neighboring municipalities in order to coordinate delivery of a comprehensive regional multi-use trail network that is a part of a multi-pronged solution to the Atlanta region's transportation challenges. Patty? Thank you very much. Um, this first slide, I think, speaks for itself. Um, the, this is a small part of the Atlanta region. Um, the Atlanta region itself is over 8,000 square miles as defined by the U.S. Census, which is about the size of the state of Massachusetts. So. When you talk about a regional trail network, um, you've, you've got a lot of partners. What we focus on in Brookhaven, of course, is the city of Brookhaven. Brookhaven is a new city, started in 2012. I joined just in 2016. Um, and since then, we have launched a ma several major trail initiatives. One of them, the Peachtree Creek Greenway, which just opened, uh, the short long-term plan but frankly in the short term is to connect that to the atlanta belt line which is one of the largest urban renewal projects in the, in the country really um it is it's the the atlanta belt line if you look at that map is right in this right there in the center it's being done in pieces but eventually will encircle the the heart of atlanta and all those spurs you see off it is what pretty much everybody around there is working on. Um, I apologize that, that you'll see a gray circle up there if you look at Chambly, Brookhaven, come south to Clarkston, Pine Lake. That is Interstate 285. That is the interstate, like most major metropolitan areas, we have an interstate that surrounds the city. And um, the cities around there are the really considered the metro commuting area. People commute from all over the place, but this is sort of the heart of it. Um, Atlanta is a wonderful place. Uh, however, it is known worldwide for its traffic and congestion problems. We are uh, in the NRIX 2019 scorecard, Metro Atlanta was 10th in the United States among large cities for traffic congestion, 47th in the world, which we, one of the solutions to that is last mile connectivity. And one of the solutions for national last mile connectivity are multi-use paths. And I think you can see from that map that Atlanta has recognized that. Um, it's a challenge, it's expensive, but it's just about the only way we're really, go one of the few ways we're really going to be able to get people out of their cars on those short trips and get them using MARTA, which is our, our transit. Next slide, please. One of the issues I think lots of us have um, is that trails up until really a few years ago were defined in many people's minds and in, fin in financial terms as part of a recreational system, which is a great thing. It's wonderful how to have trails for recreation and for health for all of us. However, as traffic challenges got worse and worse and pedestrian safety became issues, I think they became more a solution to a problem. In order to really coordinate that, just like any metro transit or metro, metro road system that's really going to be a solution, the reason I'm on here as a director of strategic partnerships is that we really need to define this and one municipality cannot define that. One municipality cannot go out and say, our trails are going to be multi-use trails because you can't commute from one side of the city to another. You've got to get from one city to another or to the transit, or to buses, or to a, a central parking area. So one of the things that we have found working with our partners, and what's most important is timing, prioritization, and planning. Um, and you can't do that by just checking people's comp plans, going on their website, seeing what's happening. One thing that we're finding is that we really need to have granular level meetings amongst multiple cities and planners to find out what's going to be happening over the next couple of years, what different um, ruling bodies feel is a priority. We may want to have our multi-use trail to connect to a multi-use trail in, in Atlanta, 
However, the city on the other side of us might want to be completely focused on their downtown center right now. So we've got to figure out where to invest very, very limited funds. Um, and of course, the next dot is connectivity, connectivity, and more connectivity. Commuting from one side of your town to the other does nothing for you. People are going to use it for recreation. As I said, that's a wonderful thing. But unless they really see it as a dependable long-term solution, it is not going to become a part of your culture. We've got to connect to transit. We need to get people to commercial centers. Critically, we've got to get people to centers of employment, and that can really drive something. Um, we have Children's Healthcare of Atlanta, which is one of the largest employers in the state, relocating to Brookhaven, right on the edge of Atlanta. And that has really put our trail system on the fast track because it's not simply important to locals, it's important to everybody. It's a very, very important piece of our economic development. Um, big employers need to get people to their offices. And in Atlanta, it's ideal to get to an office without having to get into a car. Um, you've got to be near a population center, just like any kind of transit, and it's got to be an affordable population center because being able to not have a vehicle is a real win for affordable housing in most metro areas. You've got to then have to have a re general regional discussion on specifications for your trail. What is a multi-use trail, which is what I work in, as opposed to a recreational trail? Um, will people be able to depend that it's going to be wide enough, that it's going to be safe in the rain, um, and that it is going to have the right buffers? How is that going to work? But also a trail reflects a community. So we need to have those dis those conversations. Again, the conversation about, about scooters that nobody thought they were going to be having on this level just a few years ago. Uh, the State Department of Transportation is obviously a critical partner. A lot of these trails can be built on right of way because the most ideal, if there's enough, the best place to have them is near a state route because state routes often are transportation centers. And that's where you're going to get to MARTA and it's where you're often in MARTA or your, your station. Um, and it's often where you can have your centers of employment. And then, of course, your state and regional agencies. I think a lot of us find that these trails are built on pieces of land that may be floodplain, often railroad corridors, hence the name of your organization, um, but places where you're really going to have to work through your EPD, um, you're going to work around economic development groups, your Department of Natural Resources obviously is a critical partner for many of these, Department of Community Affairs with your health plans, your state long-term plans, and of course your regional commissions um, who are really your voice with your federal funding and help coordinate throughout. Next slide, please. And part of having all those multiple pa multiple partners means you've got a lot of fractured funding, and that's coming into a, something that is becoming more and more expensive, um, simply because one demand, two, these trails need to be built to transportation specifications in order to really address the need in a number of areas. The Federal Highway recommends a 10 foot, 10 feet trail to be used for multi-use transportation, and in some cases, bring it down to eight. We're finding a minimum of 14 is really what's necessary to address a need. That's a lot of land, it's a lot of cement, it's a lot of engineering. Very informal estimate that I got myself, so I'll take responsibility for it. Um, I spoke to a couple of people, you know, people who are, who are running trails projects right now, anywhere from a conservative F, estimate five to to eleven million dollars per mile per trail and unless you've got a lot of miles you're not going to be able to build that dependable connection to your centers of employment to your neighborhoods and to your transit so here's the sampling and i, I don't want to repeat rob just went did a great comprehensive list but and my partners for instance the state of georgia has 10 community improvement districts 10 of, all 10 of them are in metropolitan Atlanta. They are critical partners in this um, because they know how important it is and they're a source of funding to get things going. They can get planning and engineering going, for instance. Tax allocation districts, which is actually how the Atlanta Beltline is, is primarily funded. We've got our, one, our Peachtree Creek Greenway, a segment of that is funded by a bond that is backed by hotel motel tax. I know other cities that are looking at the same. Private foundation support is critical to get started but it is difficult you, you simply can't depend on that market 
to build a transportation project to really get where you need to get. Um, critical, but really, I would say, growing and strained at the same time. Commercial zoning ordinances are critical, and obviously, you've got to have partners there, but that also has limitations when it comes to you don't want to negatively affect, affect economic development. Um, individual property donations, I think this varies throughout the country, harder and harder to come, find, to come by as these become more and more popular. Special purpose local option sales tax, um, are, that is a great resource for us here in the metro area. However, there's a lot of demands on that. Then for recreation and transportation, more municipal bonds, local property tax, there's great state funding. There's also the um, rail, uh, excuse me, some good national federal funding for that. Um, and then really the big dogs in this and, and what's critical if this is going to answer transportation challenges in metropolitan areas, transportation alternatives, surface transportation block for grants, and again, stimulus. They're, they're, the last stimulus package, the American Recovery Act, was very helpful and I think kind of blew the lid off this to, to some extent, at least got it rolling. And I would certainly hope that if there is another stimulus package, we'll be we'll be seeing some important attention paid, paid to this. It's great for health and it's, it's fantastic for that last mile connectivity. And I could not, not, I think one of the most fascinating things of what I do is the um, community partnerships. It's, these, are, these are four metro trails, interconnected eventually, but really um, important partnerships. The left, the left is an image of the Atlanta Beltline. Part of that is, is an incredible art project that they've got going along there. They've integrated that, but it's really an urban and, and they've completely embraced that urban feel. Um, they've got some great urban parks right there. Then if you go to the right, that is the Silver Comet Trail, which is sort of the great granddaddy of the trails in the Atlanta area. Um, it, started many years ago. It actually goes from Smyrna and now over the state line into Alabama. It will connect to the Atlanta Beltline. When that happens, it will be over 300 miles of continuous paved trail. Um, by the time it happens, I don't know if it will be the longest in the country. Right now, it's, it's projected to be. Uh, the one on the left is Path 400, which is also going to connect to the Beltline. And one thing, I, if they've got lots of great things going on, one thing I love about that shot is it's 400 is an interstate in Atlanta that goes straight up from Atlanta up to the northern suburbs, and they embrace that 100%. They've used a lot of Georgia Department of Transportation right of way. Parts of it go right along the highway, and um, it goes through Buckhead, but they've made it their own. And the one on the right is actually the Peachtree Creek Greenway, which just opened a few months ago. That will connect to Path 400 and to the Beltline, and eventually, as you go around the Beltline, to the Silver Comet Trail. The Greenway, which comes, which will really come right out of Atlanta, and if you look at Atlanta, which is a very metro, metro trail, the Brookhaven Trail, which is also a heavily, heavily metro area, um, is sort of a hiatus. It's, it's real nice. It, it goes along a stream bank, and that creek right there is being restored with EPA money. As, as we move forward. So those community partnerships matter. You'll notice those trails are all trails that you can really use as multi-use trails, but they have their own personality. And that's the end of my partnership presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Patty. All right, so uh, Jenny Sullen is next. She grew up in Madison, Wisconsin, enjoying biking um, on the Elroy Sparta Rail Trail, which has uh, some claims to being the first. Um, and for the past 27 years, she's enjoyed the trails of Morgantown, West Virginia. Jenny's a 13-year Morgantown City Council member, a former mayor and a huge rail trail supporter. Morgantown works hard to contribute local funding for trail enhancements projects, public participation activities, engineering expertise, riverfront park improvements, art installations, music events, physical activities, trail town economic development programs, and regional and national trail planning. So, Jenny. So, so we're on the Mon River Trail System, which is a 50-mile system, and we're Morgantown, West Virginia, which is uh, 30,000 students and 30,000 residents, roughly a little bit, a little bit shy of that. 
to um, just around 60,000 people in the in the metro area. Pardon me, in the metropolitan area, and then we have a much wider a much wider area in our county. So um, this is the first. This is the northernmost point, and this connects to the Sheepskin Trail, which will then connect, hopefully, to the Great Allegheny Passage and be part of a much wider network of uh, 1,500 miles um, and the industrial heart as part of the Industrial Heartland Trails Coalition. So that would be West Virginia, Pennsylvania, Ohio, New York. Um, it would be a, a very, very long, lovely trail. So we're, we're getting ready to connect up. It, it'll be some years because there's quite a few bridges and connections to make first. But, um, but they are coming and they're all along every stretch of our trail, there's some sort of, some sort of um, improvements going on. And as noted by the previous speakers, there's innovative funding going on, there's innovative partnerships going on. Um, there are people who live and die by trails and think that this is the absolute best thing that ever happened to our community, um, myself included. So it's really been um, something that has been worked on for a long time. And I'm just going to run through a set, of, a set of slides and just show you some individual examples about how we're making this work and how we're making this work even, even under the current um, COVID-19 crisis. And um, I am very hopeful that we will continue funding for these projects. Um, the one other thing I would comment on is that our MMPO just completed a year-long um, study uh, that was a, um, a plan for bicycle and pedestrian transportation in our whole, in our, in our region and connecting up the trails and working on pedestrian infrastructure and um, bicycle routes and just a whole comprehensive plan. Our plan um, has some individual costs by some of the, arranges for costs under some of the individual projects. No one compiled the entire project because it would just be mind boggling. So we had we 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 just sort of assured people that this would be done on a on a piece by piece basis. So um, next slide. So this is one of our trail trailheads. It's a recent photo. Our trailheads are all very, very full. And luckily, we have not had to um, to close any of the trails. And the next slide is the um, the data. There we go. So that's the Van Voris trail, Trailhead. And the Van Voris Trailhead has been featured on um, the Rails to Trails, um, one of the newsletters or some, some of the recent communications. Um, so this, this shows um, during, during and after, like three different points during and after um, spring breaks. And basically what it shows is that with half of our population gone this year, so our students left after, um, actually before spring break. So with, ha with, ha with at least a third of our population gone, um, we are up over last year, 100%, and over um, from 2018 till now, 142% at this specific location. So my message here is to keep your trail counters on during this um, health crisis because people are coming out in droves trying to um, get their exercise and their stress reduction. And so our trails are definitely being used now. Next slide. This is an example of social distancing. This is Christian Abilzo, who's the vice president of the Mon River Trails Conservancy. And, uh, and, the, and, the, and the joke here, it's just under six feet. <laughs> so anyway, if you just look at that, you can tell where you have to be on our trails and why um, the width that Patty was talking about is so important. Um, just looking into the future, it's just very important to have some good width on your trail so that people can um, can be healthy while they're exercising and using these transportation corridors. Next slide. This is who we're planning all this for. So these are middle school students, and this is part of a this is part of a group that provides bicycles to some of the kids so that all the kids can have a bicycle and they ride in the winter. So they're they're um, they're working on their fortitude. Uh, we have a high incidence of um, health problems in our area, and so getting kids out and active is really important. Uh, and trying to um, get bike racks at schools and having people use these trails for active transportation and all of the other connectivity that we can muster. Um, one example of funding 
um, right in this exact area is there's a trail, a proposed trailhead that hasn't been funded. It, it um, We tried to fund it, but it came back a little bit too expensive. And there's some money that has to be spent in a nearby TIF district. Uh, that money has to be spent by December. And so we're using kind of the urgency of the fact that that money needs to be spent to suggest that that might fund a trailhead and some uh, lighting along the trail and some other other important um, improvements. And so using those TIF dollars when other dollars might not be available um, and hence the idea of creative funding. Um, this is example of being ready to connect to the Great Allegheny Passage. Um, Ella Belling, who runs our, our um, Mon River Trails Conservancy, um, worked with the Great Allegheny Passage to have their, um, this is their um, book of designs. Um, but using our colors so that we were collaborating with that group, um, which is quite quite a ways away from right here, to make sure that we could have um, some uh, cohesion between, um, so it would be cohesive between the two, um, two sign um, possibilities. And I, I think, is that Kelly Pack on the left there? I think this is a, I think this is a Rails to Trails uh, a group that was, um, that was looking at all the infrastructure along the trail. Next slide. This slide is here. This is our um, Hazel Ruby McQueen Park, and it's now being renovated, and that will be the next slide that we're not going to quite yet. But this is a really neat example of our bike to work day. But what's um, important here to me is the number of people, as a, as a city council person, I like to see how many people are here from city government so that when, um, when we're trying to work proposals through city government, I'm a policymaker, I don't do anything on the ground as much as I would like to. And uh, so there are quite a few, our city attorneys here, our city managers here, uh, one of our engineers is here, quite a few people from the police force. Well, it's just really important um, to have as many people on board um, throughout the community, but I was surprised at how helpful it is to have more people at City Hall that are vested in these kinds of projects, similar to what Rob was saying. Next slide. So this is um, a completely different view, but this is a recent renovations from a private foundation. Um, so this is $4 million worth of from the Ruby McQueen Foundation that was noted earlier. Um, so that is a historic depot, a new restroom facility, a large um, covering over our amphitheater, over the audience portion. Um, and then not pictured there is a, a green room and a place for police to put their equipment um, who help with policing the rail trail. So. Next slide. Um, this is a new bridge and one request we made, uh, this bridge has been in maybe for two years, um, but one request we made was that when they were creating this that they make it look pretty <laughs> because it's very easy to make a very utilitarian bridge. It just takes that little bit extra effort um, to make it look nice. And this is an example of social rides, which we have a lot of social uh, Friday afternoon social rides that um, where people can just come and ride on the trail, but also within the city and practice riding in city streets, which ours are narrow and historic. This is an example of what can be done even when there is a um, COVID-19 um, issues with different um, projects moving forward, but this is a family business. And so um, this is Dave Holzer and Sons. <laughs> and so they're making a connection into Reedsville, one of our more um, remote locations. You can see the next slide. So this goes into a neighborhood in a very small, in a very small um, community and it connects up to a park. And so it's being, it will be used by local people, but also by visitors who, um, when they come up the Decker's Creek Trail could turn off and there's a really nice plant nursery that has restaurant with it. Next slide. So this is, this is um, the, the person's name is Eddie Spaghetti. That's his, um, that's his art name. And he says, I got a, a, cute, a cool mural job on the rail trail just wanted to share. So this is something that can be done when people, artists have a harder time making a living right now. Um, this was crowdfunded through um, a volunteer and, uh, and there are gonna be three locations where we're gonna have some of this nice painting on a trail shelter. Last slide. This is a picture of my grandson. He's on a Strider bike and um, this is, 
this is what we all need to focus on is keeping it fun and keeping kids and adults able to keep this attitude while they're commuting or recreating or otherwise using um, our rails trails. So thank you very much. Okay, yeah, thank you. And uh, thanks to uh, all the panelists for your great insights. Um, you, uh, for the audience, you may now uh, pose your questions in the box on the right side of your screen. But before we answer them, I will share how Congress could address the need for more strategic investment and how you can help. So Rails Trails Conservancy uh, in the last month has collected from partners over 125 projects that need focused public investment to move them forward. If you haven't yet shared your regional plans or projects with us, please send them to our case study template link. And this list already includes plans that are ripe enough to be part of an economic stimulus, as well as plans that are robust enough to require the kind of focused funding that could only come from a policy like uh, what is in the Connecting America's Active Transportation System Act. So we need more money and we need better policy. And you can also help by contacting your member of Congress today to share your plans and urge their support for a quartet of bills that would more than double federal investment in active transportation. These bills will increase existing core programs, transportation alternatives and the recreational trails program. It would direct a share of federal lands, transportation dollars to walking and biking, and it will accelerate connectivity, the latter of which it really needs special uh, emphasis in terms of any context you have with Congress. Um, so what are the prospects for substantial transportation investment to pass Congress this year? It's the question of the day. The situation on Capitol Hill is very fluid, and so it's hard to read the tea leaves, but earlier indications were that they could have moved very quickly to invest in infrastructure, but now a stepwise approach is starting to come into focus. In the coming weeks, we expect Congress's attention to fixate on providing further immediate relief for direct coronavirus impacts. We no longer expect that this will be the vehicle for infrastructure investment. However, in the months that follow from now, Congress is expected to focus on economic stimulus, that is measures to put Americans back to work. And um, further, by the end of September, Congress must, pass a new federal transportation law or extend the current one called the FAST Act, which was from 2015. The House Transportation and Infrastructure Committee is presently writing a bill and hinting that they're close to releasing their language. The Senate Environment and Public Works Committee passed a bill last year, but there are three other Senate committees that have yet to act. So that's where we are in the process. We now have politically diverse players ranging from House Speaker Nancy Pelosi to the Transportation and Infrastructure Chairman Peter DeFazio to uh, President Trump and the Senate Environment and Public Works Chairman uh, Barrasso that all favor big infrastructure investments uh, within the stimulus legislation. However, we also have Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell who is opposed to deficit spending for infrastructure. Uh, so we pre uh, present, we have prepared at RTC for a, a number of scenarios, including the possibility that stimulus could pump fresh investment into right projects, as well as perhaps the more likely scenario that stimulus could help fund an extension of the FAST Act or support reauthorization, perhaps for a two-year time frame. Failing investment via um, stimulus legislation, Congress could default to a short-term extension to get past the November election, as little progress has been made to identify sufficient revenue to fund a, five, a full five-year reauthorization bill, and such political tasks become harder during election season. Short-term extensions, however, fail to provide the certainty needed to plan and execute large capital projects. So there's some resistance to defaulting that way. So in short, a unique set of political and economic circumstances suggest a significant likelihood that Congress could at least provide resources to support a longer than normal extension or a shorter than normal reauthorization this year. And that means we all need to be engaged right now in helping shape those policies. And with that, um, let's start uh, looking at the questions coming in from the participants. So, uh, okay, so one question's come in. 
uh, which I'll take a first whack at and see if others have uh, thoughts about, is how do we engage powerful forces to strengthen our position on Capitol Hill? And so examples are the construction industry or um, departments of transportation or chambers of commerce. And my thought on that is uh, uh, for departments of transportation, uh, we have you know, worked closely with many of the state departments um, on you know, various trail projects as well as you know, long distance trails like the Great American Rail Trail. And, uh, and uh, one of the uh, very uh, good developments in recent years is that ASHTO, the uh, National Association of these State DOTs, has established an active transportation council. It's been very active. The chair of that uh, is the secretary for Caltrans. His name's Toks Umishakin. And, um, and uh, he was previously in the Tennessee DOT. And we've worked really well with, with Tokes and, and with that council and um, have that as a conduit to have an ongoing dialogue with the people dealing with these issues within the state DOTs. And, uh, and I would, uh, would add that um, Caltrans, the, the California department, um, has you know, come out in active support of having federal connectivity funding like what we were talking about earlier. So that's definitely a, a, an area where we've had some progress. In terms of chambers of commerce, I think there's been less of a conversation with the national chamber, the US chamber, but, um, but from the ground up, relationships with chambers of commerce have been very strong. And, and actually, Jenny might want to pick up on this thread in that in the Industrial Heartlands Trail region in her part of the world, I think local chambers of commerce have been very, very supportive of trails because of the economic development potential. Um, so actually, let me, let me stop there and just see if uh, the, uh, the other panelists have thoughts about, uh, about this question. I guess um, what I've noticed with trails is that you don't always realize what the economic impact is or the, or the um, allure to businesses. So one thing that was um, sort of discovered in our area was that people weren't always citing their businesses along the trail just so that they could um, attract customers, but often it was in part for their employees who wanted to be able to use the trail at lunch or wanted to use it for transportation to get to work. And so it would make, um, our city manager uses the term employer of choice. It makes you an employer of choice to be along a trail because then um, your employees as well as your customers can use it. And so that would make it very um, alluring to chambers of commerce who like to see um, businesses who can compete. Mm -hmm. Great, yeah. And uh, actually, do others have, have thoughts on this question? Okay. Yeah. Hey. I was just going to echo that. There, there's almost nobody that doesn't benefit from a good trail system. So I would engage more rather than less. Um, if they're not really worked into it, it may be because they, they just don't know or understand it because they are so bogged down with what they're doing. Sometimes when you go directly to a business, they're really busy running a business. But when you get a biz, a group of business persons who are, you know, working, for instance, a chamber of commerce or a local uh, merchants group, when you can get them together into into some good meetings with the community um, and with their own employees, very often, who would be very excited not only to have, um, in, in a lot of ways, like just some place to go out and walk at lunchtime, um, take a break or an easier way to get to get to work. And when you, you know, when you move that, you, you know, start there and you go up to your regional chambers and you get up into your elected officials starting to pay a lot of attention because there's critical economic development in, involved in, in all of this, not just from a commuting standpoint, but from being able to walk over to a trail that can, you know, let you move, walk over to a park for a little while. And there's, there's so many levels to engage in, I would say more rather than less is really how you're going to win that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually, um, picking up on that thread of just how much this benefits so many different constituencies, uh, one of our, our, our strong uh, partners over the years and getting stronger all the time have been uh, local governments. Um, so we work very closely, of course, with local governments in local projects, but also National League of Cities, U.S. Conference of Mayors, 
you know, are very close partners of ours, and they increasingly are prioritizing um, these kinds of investments and trying to figure out how to, you know, have a good dialogue on Capitol Hill about those things. And, and uh, you know, often those, those uh, local elected officials, like, like Jenny, are, are, are folks trying to deliver for their constituents in all those different policy areas. And this is something that makes a contribution across the board. So that's, that's a really um, strong way to proceed. So when your trails person like Ella Belling comes to you and wants something and you're a public official, you try really hard to say, yes, how can I help you? Because you can see how hard volunteers and professionals are working and they really need the support of people um, across the board, whoever. We have a, um, a Mon River Task Force that includes um, chamber, um, all of the usual people you'd expect to, to work on our river and also um, Main Street, a Main Street representative and an arts representative, but just lots of different, lots of different people mm -hmm. all working together to try to do some master planning. Yeah. All right, I got a second question and it's about whether the economic downturn is likely to affect funding from federal, state and local governments <laughs> and what you can do about it, right? Um, this is a very good question. <clears throat> I'll say from the federal end, it's um, you know it's what we've been talking about already, where um, where the what, where the federal government is uh, willing to look at doing some debt spending to uh, to keep the economy going, and so that's leading to some short-term opportunities. But that I you know I'm I realize that there could be long-term you know pain in terms of <laughs> um, bringing that into balance, but uh, but in the short run. There's there's actually um, an opportunity there in terms of state and local state legislatures have mostly been uh, closed since the epidemic hit and so it, there's just a pause button there that we've seen um, but we're seeing both in terms of um, state and local government interest that there's just an element of needing to adapt to the circumstances so for instance lots of folks are talking about is there a way to create some open streets that would allow people to remain, you know, if trails get too crowded, can you provide near to home places to be active and socially distanced? And so that's a very topical issue. And because the, the local governments are operating so, you know, so close to the people and how they're being affected in the immediate term, they're able to be nimble and, and respond to those circumstances and try to look for, for answers. And so I, I do think it's gonna call on us to, to um, be, be up to date in terms of the climate out there and, and being opportunistic. But uh, other thoughts on that? I could say here in Oregon, we are very dependent on gas tax. And so that is something to be concerned about just because mm -hmm. people are driving so much less. And you know it's interesting because there, we have conflicting goals here because on the one hand, our policies call for people <laughs> to drive less, right? So we don't necessarily want 100% of that to come back but we also depend on that revenue. Uh, I think we're fortunate here in Eugene that we have a pretty diverse set of funding sources that pay for active transportation projects, including our bond measure, the fees on developers, the federal funding and the state funding. And so I think that it's always good to have a, a wide range of funding available to you um, in order to, um, to have a balanced funding program for your transportation system. Okay. So the next question is about examples of economic impact of trail development in rural areas that don't have a university, wanting to show the relevance of this investment in diverse geographic regions. So uh, let me throw in one example I'm, I'm aware of, I think is very impressive is, uh, and then see if others have, have uh, examples they'd like to share here. Uh, but my example would be Cumberland, Maryland in the Panhandle. Um, where it is at the uh, it's at the terminus of the CNO Canal Trail, and it's at the beginning of the Great Air Allegheny Pass, which uh, Jenny had mentioned looking into uh, earlier. And so you can go off road from from Washington D.C. to Pittsburgh and now beyond, um, you know, uh, on these trails. And when those uh, came in, Cumberland hit, was a, was very much hurting. It was a coal mining town that had lost its coal mining industry and uh, and uh, we ran a ride through there and the mayor came out and said you know this is the biggest thing that's happened in Cumberland in 35 years this is and ever since then we do see uh, a whole lot of economic development that's grown up around if they call themselves a trail town for a reason um, and and then he, and then his uh, applause line was and it's the biggest encampment since the Civil War so we, 
we had a good time with that. But um, do others have examples of it? We don't have a lot of rail trails in Oregon, um, I think because uh, maybe we had a less dense rail network. And so most of our railroads are still being used. But we, we do have a, a very successful event here called Cycle Oregon. That's a week long biking trip that goes through small towns or, or around different parts of the state every year. And I haven't participated in a week long ride myself, but my understanding is that it really injects um, a lot of energy and revenue into small communities. And they actually have a grant program where they give some of the money back to projects in these small towns. So events that use active transportation can also help um, rural communities that don't have colleges and universities. And um, one of the things we have in Oregon, because we don't have the, the, um, the rails to trails projects, but we do have our scenic bikeways. So a lot of really low volume, rural roadways, and those are the kinds of, of roads that Cycle Oregon event travels on. Mm -hmm. Okay, next question um, is, are there resources for community groups to use to quantify what the economic impact value is of their trails? We'd love to use this to leverage funding when talking to state representatives and lawmakers. So one very simple thing I'll, I'll mention, which is just part of our template, for people giving us projects for the work we're doing right now on policy is that uh, is, is what I'd mentioned earlier about AASHTO having um, estimated that there are 17 jobs per million uh, project cost in just the construction phase. And then there are loads of other kinds of impacts and, um, and various you know, folks have, have uh, done some quantification there, but I'm not uh, aware of um, very formulaic ways to do that. And so it'd be interesting to see if any of the other, uh, any of the panelists are aware of, of uh, those such tools. We've got, I think I'm on. Mm -hmm. Can Here. you hear me? Yep. There's a very good study that's been done that actually could address both of those questions on the Silver Comet Trail. The Silver Comet Trail starts out in urban Atlanta and goes through rural Georgia to Alabama. Um, and I, I, refer, I refer to that often. It's such a changing field that whenever I look at it, I think it's probably low, but that is a good one to give a, a conservative estimate of the economic impact on trails. It was done in about 2013. I'm not aware of an update. I would love, you know, we, we don't have any empirical data yet on the, the Beltline and the Metro Atlanta trails. When that comes out, I think that that will really tell you a lot about it. But that's one of the best ones I know of, and I'm sure there are others. I would love to hear from, from other people on the panel or others if they've got some, because I think there's a lack of information in that area because it's such a, a quickly growing field. But I think we underestimate it. Um, not just the construction, but the long-term economic, long economic impact for all sorts of um, population centers, not simply urban. It's a great mm -hmm. question. Yeah, it is. It is a great question. I think that um, lots of universities, you know, you're talking about the impacts in rural areas, but lots of rural areas are adjacent to university areas and could mm -hmm. work through um, the de economic development portion of their university. Okay, great. Yeah. To, to get some studies and collect some data. So Christian built so near us. He's 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 been collecting. He's he works at WVU and he's been um, collecting data um, and and including data from rural areas. Yes. So so what uh, if you looked at the um, Rail Trails Conservancy's trail building toolbox? We have done a number of studies over the year about you know essentially the direct spending. That happens once you've got a good rail trail out there uh, so goods and services kinds of spending that's one thought and we also have a report called active transportation transforms america where we were from a global standpoint documenting the the value of these investments one of the key drivers of that is the healthcare costs avoided from getting greater physical activity mm. so you you can you can see look at our methodology there and think about whether that has any application to to your circumstance if I can just go back, I, I just wanted to give the name of that study. It's the Silver Comet Trail Economic Impact and Analysis Planning Study, and it was Headwalk, Headwaters Economics. And if anybody, specific person look, asking that question might want to Google that and get some good information there. Great. So I'm recognizing that uh, we are at uh, time. 
uh, for our hour. And I really, again, thank you to all the panelists for their uh, great presentations and great insights in the questions. And uh, thank you to uh, all of the audience participants for, uh, for listening in. And uh, please, again, keep in mind the, uh, the resources uh, we've provided on the slides. And, uh, and uh, you know, any, as much as you can, please help by uh, reaching out to your members of Congress, telling them it's, uh, you know, it is definitely time to have these kinds of federal investments to support this good state and local work. And, uh, and in particular, uh, you know, please pick up on these, these lessons we've heard today about how important it is to put all the pieces together and have a, a working system and to connect communities to each other and have this be an economic driver, uh, and th that this works in rural, suburban, and urban contexts. And so, uh, you know, we really appreciate uh, having all that come into focus from your three individual stories and, uh, and the collective wisdom here. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Bye.